Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. James McGall. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and hello, everybody. I am happy to be here, and I hope that you're all happy to be here, or that you will be happy to be here. We will soon find out. Now, what she didn't say is that um, I came here in 1964. How many of you were here in 1964? You remember anything? Just keep your hand up if you remember anything about 1964. <laughs> All right, keep that in mind, keep that in mind. Uh, now, be honest, how many of you uh, <clears throat> sometime during the day had to be reminded about coming here tonight? Well, you're not honest, first of all. I, I, I have to try a little harder. How many of you drove here tonight? How many of you drove without the aid of a GPS? <laughs> not as many, but we're getting there. Well, uh, memory is, is pretty important. Uh, the brain is the most complicated structure in the known universe. There is nothing that even comes close. And of all the things that the brain does, the most important is to make and preserve memories. And we know that because if you don't have them, you wouldn't be here tonight. Uh, you wouldn't be. You wouldn't be because you wouldn't know to eat. You wouldn't know to drink. You wouldn't know where to go or what to do. You wouldn't know how to make children. There would no, be no descendants and there would be no ancestors because there are no descendants to make ancestors. All of that requires memory. Now, this, this has been noted by almost everybody. There's a philosopher here at uh, UC Irvine, uh, Berniker, who just wrote a book on memory. And I stole this from him, and it is so profound. Remembering is a fundamental cognitive process subserving virtually all other important cognitive functions. Not virtually all. The virtually can be taken out of there. It's, it's better than all of the rest of them. If you don't have memory, you don't know that you were ill. If you don't have memory, you don't know when to be hungry. It is that fundamental. Now, it's, it's not only fundamental, but it's very surprising when you think about it. As we go through life, we uh, capture a lot of information. You can remember when, when you came in. You can remember when you drove up. You can remember what you did a little earlier in the day. It gets a little bit uh, weaker as we go back in uh, days and months. But it also is weaker for some of the events. We don't remember everything that we experience. And this is captured in this quotation here. Our brains, as remarkable as they are, could not begin to contain and give equal weight to our every moment of life. And they don't. There's something about this enormous, brilliant capacity of our brains to store information, but it doesn't store all information. Some things we remember very well, and some things we don't remember very well at all. Even right now, um, I think most, if not all of you, are, are wearing shoes, and I can draw your attention to the pressure on your left foot that's created by a shoe. And you don't even note that, and you don't remember it. It's just part of the sensations that you have that don't get captured, don't get caught up for remembering. Now, William James worried a lot about this. William James was the most famous psychologist, physiologist ever, published a book in 1890, which was the dominant book for decades and is still one of the best books ever written in the field. And he said, of some experiences, no memory survives the instance of their passage. We know that. Others may be recalled as long as life endures. How can we explain these differences? So how can we explain these differences? Well, philosophers before scientists thought about this a lot, and we have a clue here uh, from Francis Bacon, who says, memory is assisted by anything that makes an impression on a powerful passion and emotion, inspiring fear, for example, or wonder, shame, or joy. So anything that is, that is exciting that creates an emotional response assists memory. This was noted a long time ago. I was very sorry to see that because I thought I invented it. And it turns out that uh, <laughs> Francis Bacon thought about it before I did. And so did uh, Gary Larson, uh, who said, uh, I'll read it to you, it said, more facts of nature, all forest animals to this very day remember exactly where they were and what they were doing when they heard that Bambi's mother had been shot. 
So each one remembers where they were. I was getting right across the interstate. I was down by the edge of the lake and so on. They all have this memory. But so what? So what if emotion makes strong memory, as Francis Bacon said, and as Gary Larson captured in this cartoon? Here's the so what from Descartes, who said in 1650, the usefulness of all the passions or the emotions consists in their strengthening and prolonging in the soul, that is in the mind, thoughts which are good for it to conserve. That's the function. It's not just that experiences are emotionally arousing are better remembered, but they have a function. They're better remembered because they serve a purpose. If you are excited about where you find food, you want to remember where to go and get it. If you are distressed by something that annoyed you, then you want to know how to avoid that. If you have a wonderful sexual experience, you figure that out by yourself. <laughs> now, what, what happens? What happens when, uh, when uh, you get excited? And the excitement can be mild or it can be horrendous. The body takes care of this automatically. There is absolutely nothing that you can do to control it. If you get excited, even modestly excited, you're going to release epinephrine or adrenaline. That's the same thing with different words. You're going to release epinephrine, and you're going to start the synthesis of cortisol, which will be released in increasing amounts, uh, peaking about a half hour later. And this will happen anyway. Uh, if somebody says to you for something that you did, you mowed the lawn and did a nice job, Somebody says, nice job, cortisol and epinephrine will be released. If you mow the lawn and you cut down all of the fav favorite plants, somebody will say that was a horrible thing and you'll remember that as well. It doesn't make any difference. The adrenal glands do not care. They don't know. All they know is that when something happens that's exciting, good, bad, then they are going to be, these hormones are going to be released into the bloodstream and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, an example that, that uh, I like is uh, when I get interviewed by journalists, and uh, let's say it's over the telephone, which it usually is, and at some point they say, this isn't clear to me. And I say, well, now I'll make it clear to you. I'm going to say something which is not true, but listen to it. It's not true, but I'm going to say it to make a point. And I say, are you ready? And I say, yes. I say, you know, I've been listening to you for half an hour. You're really pretty stupid. <laughs> And I said, are you feeling warm? Yes, I'm feeling warm. Well, that's the adrenaline, the epinephrine, which has been released into the bloodstream. I said, if you looked in the mirror, you will see that you are red. There's nothing that you can do about it. That was the automatic action. I didn't hit them. You know, they were not assaulted. All I did was insult them. And the same thing would happen if somebody you like a whole lot whispers in your ear, I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. The hormones will just, and there are other hormones as well, but that's not my topic. Now, in order to um, investigate this, which I have been doing for many years, uh, we had to model this by developing a, a, or stealing actually, I stole it from a friend of mine uh, at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. We had to, to get hold of a technique in which we could give a single event, a single experience to an animal that the animal would remember. Just a single event. It's not the, the typical kind of thing where you give an animal training, lots of training over and over and over again. No, it's just a single event. And this is the example of that. So here we have a straight alley, and you probably cannot see that there is a rat sitting here. And on the training day, this, this rat has been sitting around for 30 days in a cage waiting for Disneyland. And this is Disneyland for the animal. It's put in here, and it gets to walk into this region of the alley, which it had never seen before, never seen any equipment before. So it goes from here to here, and when it gets here, it gets a surprise. It gets a mild shock to its foot. And it's so mild that we even test it when we're experimenting to make sure it's, it's the right level. Just a little blip of an electric shock to its feet. Now, to test the animal's memory of this single event, the next day, or two days later, or a month later, we bring it back and we put it here and we ask, how long does it take the animal to wait here before it goes into this region? And the longer it is, we make an inference that that's stronger memory. So here is our memory experiment. Give the animal a little experience, test it later to see what it does. So here are some results of an early experiment, actually the first experiment of this kind 
ever done right here at Irvine with a graduate student, a postdoc of mine, Paul Gold. So here's the experiment. The animals were trained, and this is the test. The first day, the animals walked through in about 10 seconds. The second day, they stayed out for about a minute. Those are the controls. They got injected with a little bit of saline. Now we have other animals here that are injected with epinephrine or adrenaline immediately after training at a time that this hormone would normally be released. And we injected an amount that would be in the blood of an animal that was given a very strong shock. We measured that, all right? So what happens if the animals got adrenaline immediately after they were trained and then they're tested the next day? That's their memory. That's the enhancement of memory that is induced by a hormone that we have ourselves, and we're able to make a stronger memory if we administer that to the animal immediately after they're trained. Now, we knew from extensive work in our laboratory and other laboratories that, there, that the, the making of a lasting memory does not occur instantly, but it clear, occurs over time. It's called consolidation of memory. What you are listening to right now is not stored instantly. There's a beginning of storage, and it takes place over several hours. So we said, what happens if, if we delay the administration of the epinephrine a little while? And if we delay it a little while, less memory is formed. Delay it more, and less memory is formed. And delay it by two hours, and the adrenaline has no effect. And the reason for that is that the storage of memory has taken place in that period of time, and so the adrenaline, epinephrine, can't act on anything. The memory's been stored at that time. This is consolidation, and what we have found is that the hormone that you and I carry and release to ourselves when we get excited will make strong memory, and we can manipulate this in laboratory animals to make it work. All right, now, at that same time many years ago, we had been working with uh, electrical stimulation of the brain, uh, because we were interested in the influence of, the, uh, influence of stimulation that would or would not induce seizures in order to understand the role of brain seizures in memory. That was a side project. And in the course of that, we discovered that we could enhance memory with mild tickling of this region of the brain, the amygdala. It's in the medial temporal lobe. If we trained animals and tickled the amygdala with a little bit of electrical stimulation, we could get a stronger memory just as we could with the epinephrine. So we said maybe it's the case that the epinephrine acts in some way to stimulate the amygdala. That was a, a big leap that we took. Um, and, and we had to take that leap, be, that leap because uh, epinephrine does not pass the blood-brain barrier, it does not get in freely. And in sight experiments, which I'm not showing you here, uh, we found that the epinephrine acts by uh, affecting receptors that are located on the vagus nerve that goes up into the brain stem, and then norepinephrine is released within the brain. So the action of epinephrine is not in the brain, it is to influence the release of norepinephrine within the brain. That was a side project that we worked on. So we decided, let's take a look at the involvement then of this region of the brain in the medial temporal lobe. And here's the kind of experiment that we did. We implant uh, a cannula, uh, uh, just a needle, that goes down into the brain of the rat and so that we can squirt a little bit of substance here, actually usually about a fifth of a microliter is what we usually use for the infusion. So now we're giving infusions into the brain rather than into the body, and we want to see what happens. So I'll give you an example of one of many such studies that we have done. This is a very simple task in which we have um, a, a big pool of water. It's about six feet in diameter. And in, somewhere in the middle of that pool is a plexiglass um, landing platform that the animal cannot see. And so the animal's put into this big tub of water, and it swims around until it accidentally finds the platform. Just, just a plain old random thing that it does. We give the animals about six trials on this so the animal can learn somewhere in this big tub of water there is an invisible platform, and they swim to it. So the next day we measure how long it takes the animal to find the platform. So here are saline controls, animals that got injected with saline immediately after they were trained on the first day. And you can see that it took them about half a minute to find the platform on the second day. If they're never trained, 
their way up here. They just wander around. So this is learning. These animals have learned. These animals, I'm going to show you, got a dose of norepinephrine in the brain, in the amygdala, immediately after they were trained. And they found it the next day in about 10 seconds. So that in, is enhanced memory of a very different kind of learning experience. Uh, there's a higher dose is less effective. And this is critical, because I'm going to come back to this many times. If we put into the amygdala propranolol, which is a beta blocker, that is a drug that acts to block the action of epinephrine and norepinephrine, then those animals do not remember at all. So we can make very good memory, or we can make very bad memory by injecting these substances directly into this region of the brain. Now, we've examined uh, a lot of um, experimental procedures because we want to make sure that we are, what we're talking about is general about memory and is not about some specific task. So here we had a water maze task. I didn't show you. We did fear conditioning task. Uh, this is one of my favorite because I found it so unbelievable. I always like the things that are unbelievable. Um, I worked for decades giving animals lots of training and using lots of electric shock to their feet, giving them tons of water when they are heavily deprived of water, lots of food when they're deprived of food. I never thought of something that was thought of about 15 years ago by researchers in, in the UK. They said, why don't we just ask animals if they remember having seen something? That's all, simple experiment. And that's what they did, and that's what we do now. So an animal is put in a, in a, a box here, and there are two identical objects, two light bulbs. And we let them explore those light bulbs for about five minutes. That's the experiment. Just look at the light bulbs. No food, no water, no shock or anything. And then a day or two later, we put them back in the box, and now there's a different object. And we ask, which do they spend more time exploring? And it turns out that rats will explore this one more, even though they, they, have, they have never seen it before. They've seen this one before. And the inference is that there's only one reason why they're exploring that, and that is they remember having seen the other one, and they're bored with it. That's the only thing. So this is a memory task. And I'm still astonished that it works, because you just let an animal look at something, and later on say, oh yeah, I've seen that. I don't care about that anymore. I'm interested in this other thing I've never seen over here. So we took advantage of that. And we trained animals on this task. Immediately after they looked at these two objects, we squirted a little bit of norepinephrine in the amygdala. And here's what we got. The training was so low that in control animals, we couldn't e even see any evidence of memory. Just gave them a little bit of exposure. But if we followed that with a little bit of norepinephrine put directly in the amygdala, we got enhanced learning. And if we put propranolol in, that is the blocker of epinephrine and norepinephrine, we got impairment of memory. This is no memory, and this, and this is good memory. So just as we saw in the water maze, if we use this task that doesn't use any fear, any uh, uh, very complex training of any kind, just ask an animal, have you ever seen this before? We can enhance the memory of that experience. Now, in, in these and many other experiments, we have been the manipulator of the uh, neuromodulator. We have put it in. We have put in a beta blocker, or we have put in a, a norepinephrine itself. So we asked the question, what are the animals doing to themselves without our artificial help? So to do this, we put down a probe uh, into the brain and would pump a little bit of the solution in very slowly, take the solution out, and then analyze the solution for the content of norepinephrine. It's called high pressure, high, high pressure uh, liquid chromatography. And you'll see the, the experiment. So here's HBLC. Here's the probe that goes down to the brain. If you're close, you can see that this animal has a tube, two tubes coming out of it so that we can analyze the, solu the, the fluid that is coming out of this specific region of the brain. So here's the experiment. We take the animal, we train the animal, and we measure the amount of norepinephrine that is released in the animal's brain at the time of the training. Then we test the animal at a later time. So there's no pharmacology here. We're not administering anything. We're just observing what happens. So here's the experiment. Here's the rat. Maybe you can see more clearly that there are two tubes, one with solution going in, the other one coming out for analysis. So the animal was sitting in there. And at this point, these are 15-minute intervals. At this point, uh, the animal walked through and got a shock, a little shock to his feet. And what you see plotted 
is the increase in the release of norepinephrine with this animal up around the 750 or 800% increase induced by the mild foot shock. So the animal's sitting here, whammo, up goes the norepinephrine release in the amygdala. Here's an animal that also a lot of release. Here's an animal that didn't release any at all. So we have a lot of variability. Now there are two ways at least to look at this. One is to say, uh, Jim, uh, that is a mess. Uh, look at the variability there. How can you make any sense out of that? Well, there's another way to look at it. These individual animals were each tested for their memory two days later. And follow me here. This animal released about 800% increase in norepinephrine at the time it was trained. And that animal never went back in the area where it was shot. Stayed outside for 10 minutes, which as long as we test them, because the graduate students and postdocs get very bored at that time, <laughs> watching a rat doing nothing. So this is a rat doing nothing that remembers well, and that's an animal that had released a lot of norepinephrine. Here's another one that released about, I don't know, 450% increase. That animal never went back. Come down here, here's an animal that went through in 10 seconds. That animal released hardly any norepinephrine. And what you see then is a very strong relationship between the amount of norepinephrine released in this region of the brain, induced by the training, and the memory tested two days later. And in all of the work I have done over my life, this is the, this is the strongest predictor of an animal's memory. The, stronger predict, the strongest predictor that I have ever found is how much norepinephrine is released in that region of the brain of the animal. Now I'd like to say just a, a couple of things about the, the closest we can get uh, to these experiments with human memory. We can't do exactly the same experiments. Uh, undergraduate students here at UCI do not like to walk barefoot in a straight alley that's metal to get a foot shock. We can't do that. We have had very few people who would volunteer to have cannulas put in their heads. Um, actually, I, I did have some. It, it was, uh, I, I was uh, uh, lecturing to a group uh, a couple of years ago, and in it, it had some people uh, who had been in the military, let us say the SEALs, uh, like that. And when I said I have trouble finding people who volunteer, have cannulas put in their head, a couple of hands went up. Uh, we didn't follow up on that. So I'm, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you what we what we did do uh, to try to do this. Um, uh, first, some I'll t just tell you of an experiment without showing you the data. This was our first experiment to try to get something at all looking like the animal stuff. We um, we taught uh, human subjects a, a little story. Um, two, two versions of a story, while they looked at a series of slides. So there are 12 slides that they looked at. Accompanying the slides was one story that said a boy and a mother left home, crossed the street, went to visit, visit father who worked at the, the hospital. Oh, he saw a car, went to visit father. Uh, it was disaster preparedness day, so they had people with makeup on, looked like they'd been injured. Mother would make a telephone call and went home. And they saw a picture depicting each of those. Another group saw the same pictures, but the story was boy and mother left home, they crossed the street, a car hit the boy, he was seriously injured, was rushed to the hospital, the surgeon worked frantically to save his life, and a, and a distraught mother made a telephone call and went home. They all saw exactly the same thing. They rated the emotionality uh, of the um, uh, picture, of the narrative, and they went home and that was it. Well, they got a surprise memory test several weeks later, and believe it or not, uh, those people who heard the emotional story remembered the center part of it much better than the people who heard the boring one. So that was the influence of emotional arousal on memory as depicted in this narrative. We followed that up then by giving, in another experiment, by giving half of the subjects propranolol, that is the beta blocker, before they heard the story. And the effect of that was to turn it into a boring story because they didn't remember it any better than the boring story if they had propranolol on board. So that was our first uh, study. Subsequently, Larry Cahill did an experiment very much like the rat studies in which he uh, taught human subjects the material and then injected them with adrenaline, epinephrine, immediately afterwards and found that they remembered better. The one I liked the best, however, was uh, based on our discovery, uh, uh, we were late in making this discovery, that if, if you put your hand in a bucket of water, you release a lot of epinephrine. And, and cardiologists know about this and they've used that for decades. So we said, fine, let's do that. So we had human subjects 
who were taught some material, and then we asked them to insert their hand into ice water and hold it there for a period of time, and then we tested them for memory later, and at least Cahill did, Dr. Cahill, and found that their memory was better and compared to sticking their hand into warm water. Now we had both men and women in the study uh, guess which group held their hand in the water longer? Women. women. Uh, there's no controversy over that, is it? You just said, you said women. Bunch of wimps. <laughs> Here is a more, here's a more recent study from the uh, Cahill Laboratory. A very simple study in which they showed human subjects uh, a series of emotional pictures. And then immediately after they viewed the pictures, they had them give a saliva sample and they measured in the saliva alpha amylase, which is a, an indirect measure of norepinephrine. And what they found is the, um, uh, the greater the increase or greater the amount of, uh, uh, of the alpha amylase in the saliva, the better the memory when the, when the subjects were given a surprise memory test a week later. So this fits with that. And here's another one that we did. This is an early study that we did right here in which we showed uh, human subjects a series of uh, two-minute emotional, emotionally arousing film clips. But before that, we injected, we injected them with radio-labeled glucose because we were going to do a PET scan 30 minutes later after they were injected. So they're injected, they watch the, these films, or neutral films, which I won't talk about, uh, these exciting films. And at the end of that, we got a measure of activity of the brain. They went home thinking that the experiment was over, and then they got a surprise memory test several weeks later, and these are the re result. This is the activity of the amygdala as assessed by positon emission tomography 30 minutes after they were injected, and, but immediately after they watched these awful films, and the memory tested several weeks later, and these are the individual subjects, and as you can see, there's a ve very high correlation between the amygdala activity and the memory at a later time. Now this has been replicated not only here using other measures of brain activity, including functional magnetic resonance imaging, and it's been replicated in about two dozen laboratories throughout the world uh, to get this basic finding so they can look at other features as well. So this you can take to the bank. Now here is a, a cartoon <clears throat> that uh, integrates the way that I look at this, uh, which will tell you how I think that this emotional activation acts to influence brain regions to make strong memories. You have a learning experience, and that experience is going to activate lots of regions of the brain that we know to be involved in processing of memory. That's gonna happen. That same experience is gonna activate the basal lateral amygdala, and it's gonna activate the adrenal gland. So that's just the beginning of it. Now, to the extent that, that this is a, a, an exciting experience, it's really going to turn these on, and they will provide, then, a modulatory influence. They will influence the action that's taking place over here. So let me go back. This is what's going to happen just with the learning experience itself, and then you're going to get the release of the hormones, you're going to get activation of the amygdala, and when that happens, then there's going to be a stronger memory induced by these modulatory influences. And all of the studies that I've shown you, plus many more that I have not, all are consistent with this general interpretation of what's going on. Now, I want to say something about even stronger uh, human memory. Um, I didn't tell you the whole story of what Descartes said. Uh, I gave you the first part in which he said the usefulness of all of the passions consists in their strengthening and prolonging in the soul thoughts which are good for it to conserve. And he then said, and all the harm they can do consists in their strengthening and conserving these thoughts more than is necessary. Now what disorder do you hear a lot about these days that consists of a memory that is stronger than is necessary? PTSD, PTSD. So there is, uh, um, I would say, very considerable interest and understanding today whether the kinds of processes that I've been discussing with you play a role in the formation of super strong memory. Is it the case that when somebody is assaulted or when they get their legs blown off or whatever, that the systems I've talked about just go wild and overdo what nature did not want to have happen, that is make strong memory. 
And one of, the, one of the efforts then involves the use of drugs that interfere with epinephrine and norepinephrine. Two studies were published a few years ago showing that um, if human subjects were given propranolol, that is the, the drug that blocks the action of epinephrine and norepinephrine, within a few hours after they were assaulted, then the subjects would have fewer signs of PTSD several months later. This was done by Roger Pittman at Harvard. And the way he did it was to have nurses stationed at the hospitals uh, in Boston uh, ready to sign people up to be in an experiment. And how he got the subject to sign up is beyond me. You know, somebody who's just been mugged or raped or fallen and broken an alarm or something, and they say, would you like to be part of an experiment? Anyway, he got them. <laughs> Put half of them on propranolol immediately and half of them on, on placebo, and then tested them two months later and got very good uh, signs of, um, of attenuation of PTSD by this treatment. This was replicated by another study in France, got exactly the same results. Another study um, was a study that was reported recently uh, by a military group in which they looked at uh, about 700 soldiers who were wounded in Iraq, and a, they were trying to find out uh, the differences between those that had PTSD and those that did not. So they looked at everything that was done with them, just put them in a big matrix, and they found the only thing that lessened the incidence of PTSD was morphine given within an hour. And I saw that, and I thought, this is terrific. I have to write them to tell them about the work we've done and then I did what every person is supposed to do before you react, you're supposed to read the paper first. And uh, so I read the paper carefully and found that the work here at Irvine had been cited. It turns out that, that opiates, morphine is an opiate, inhibit the release of norepinephrine. So it could be that the reason that the morphine was effective in decreasing the incidence of PTSD is because it's acting on the mechanisms that I've just described to you. And indeed, that was one of the interpretations that they offered. I mean, the other obvious interpretation is that the morphine just decreased the pain, and so it was less traumatic, or maybe both worked. But in any case, those are very promising, promising leads. Now, in the course of all of this, um, as you can see, I, I have worked literally for many decades on brain, mechanism, brain mechanisms underlying the making of very strong memory. And in the course of this, a little over, no, quite, not quite 13 years ago, I got an email from a woman who said uh, uh, she had a memory problem and she would like to discuss it with me. Well, I told her this was uh, not a memory clinic but a research institute and I, I would recommend a clinic if that's what she wanted. She said, oh, no, 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 uh, I, I think that you might want to meet me because I have a very strong memory. And I thought, well, okay, um, you know, what's the loss? I'll talk to this person and see whether her memory is strong, whether we can do something with it. Now, I guess you can't read this, but I'm going to tell you what it is. This is the kind of thing that I did and my colleagues did with me to test her uh, to find out whether indeed she did have a strong memory. So if you look at the top, I asked her to name the day of the week and the significant event on the date. Just gave her uh, the, um, the date, uh, the day of the week and significant event on the date. So we have August 16th, 1977. And uh, she had to tell me what happened. Of course, you all know that that's the day when Elvis Presley died. Uh, if, I don't want to bore you. You probably know these. Uh, June 6, 1978, uh, Proposition 13 passed in California. Um, May 25, 1979, there was a plane crash in Chicago, and lots of people were killed, and on like that. I'm giving you her responses to these questions. Uh, or, the other way around, um, uh, when was the uh, San Diego crash? Well, September 25th, 1978, and so on. It could be the other way. An event, she had to tell me the day and the date I want you to occur, or I would give her the date, and she would have to tell me the day of the week and the event that occurred. And she was almost errorless in being able to do that. Um, then on one occasion, we simply asked her to tell us the dates of the last 22 Easter's. How many of you are unable to do that? <laughs> How many of you can tell me the date of the last Easter? <laughs> well, what you see here is not only that here they gave all of the dates here, but she also told us what she did on those days. And she's Jewish. 
The first Ms. person Ms. ever identified with this ability is Jill Price, who says she feels haunted by the never-ending stream of memories and hasn't wanted to meet any of the... Um, this is Jill Price, and she is a public figure. Uh, I can talk about her because she's written a book. And nothing is held back. Held back. Um, she ha indeed has this extraordinary ability, and we appeared together on NPR, and she was on Good Morning America, and so on. Uh, as a consequence of that, uh, a number of people contacted us to tell us that they too had this ability. And uh, then in uh, December 19th, 2010, uh, there appeared a 60-minute program that showed these subjects, and, and it was on a Sunday. <laughs> That's pretty good, right? <laughs> I can do it too. <laughs> the fact that 60 Minutes is always on a Sunday is a little helpful. So this is Jill Price who got us started, and I'm going to show you, uh, how many of you people think, think you saw that 60-minute episode? Oh, great. Are you sure? <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to show you just a few clips to remind you of what was said, just a few, and then for those of you who did not see them, to introduce you to the people, and I'll make a few comments about them. So here are five new subjects, and you're going to hear Leslie Stahl ask uh, a question about uh, an earthquake, and I want you to see the way in which they respond, and I tell you in advance, it is absolutely typical of the way they respond. A 7.1 earthquake hit the San Francisco, Oakland area on October 17, 17 1989. Tuesday. I remember we were watching the game Tuesday. of the World Tuesday. Series. Tuesday. 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 Oh my gosh. Right. Are you guys oh, feeling terrible. a little competitive with each other? <laughs> <laughs> now, when, when I said there was an earthquake in San Francisco, nobody said, uh uh, let me think about it. I'll get back to you on that. Nobody looked at the ceiling. They just blew just erupted when it was, and there was a baseball going. A game going on at the same time. It's just, you know, it's just right out there. So that's the group that we had at that time. Uh, now I'm going to show you a little bit more detailed, uh, picking on one subject here. Uh, Louise Owen, who is a professional violinist in New York, of very high quality. Uh, and she's interesting not only because of her extraordinary memory, but because her personality characteristics are almost the reverse of our first subject. Our first, first subject came to us because she is annoyed, angry, depressed, because she had all of these bad memories and they keep coming back. And Louise Owen uh, lives throughout the day to play violin and make truffles and arrange flowers. Uh, she's sort of a Mary Poppins uh, uh, kind of a person and does very well, as you will see. McGaw says this type of memory is completely new to science, so he and his colleagues have had to devise their own tests, like this one on public events. October 19th, 1987. It's a Monday. Uh, that was the day the big stock market crash and the cellist Jacqueline Dupre died that day. The Berlin Wall falls on what day? Uh, November 9th, 1989, which was a Thursday. Christopher Reeve's accident occurred on what day? Uh, it was Saturday, May 27th, uh, 1995. And when were the Oscars held in 1999? In 1999. Sunday, March 21st. Yes, perfect. Am I boring you? <laughs> um, in in uh, developing questions, we have to cover a range of topics. Uh, we want to make sure that, they, that we ask them about lots of different things, not just about their pet interests. And as you can see, she knows a lot, and she remembers a lot. Um, now she's going to tell us a little bit about what goes on when she's doing the remembering. She can remember every day of her life since the age of 11. Try to talk us through, can you do that, how, sure. how it works, um, out of the air. April 21st, 1991. 1991, okay, April 21st. So in the moment between April 21st and 1991, I have scrolled through 25 April 21sts, thinking which one is it gonna be, which one is it gonna be? Okay, 1991, which was a Sunday, and I was in Los Angeles and I had a concert with the American Youth Symphony. Now I'm gonna do, uh some testing, and I want to prime you for this because uh, some, at least one critic uh, of this kind of research says, well, all these people do is sit around rehearsing. The, re the reason their memories is, are strong because they go over and over and over and over in their mind so that they won't forget. They continuously just recycle it. So we decided to ask about something which we think would be highly unlikely that anybody would go about rehearsing just to see how she would do. 
to uh, 1990. It rained on several days in January and February. Can you name the dates on which it rained? Mm. Um. <laughs> Believe it or not, she could. Let's see. It was slightly rainy and cloudy on January 14th, 15th. It was very hot the weekend of the 27th, 28th. No rain. We checked the official weather records. It rained very hard on Sunday, February 4th. And she was right. That was 20 years ago. And so the hypothesis would be in the intervening 20 years, every day she rehearses, I have to remember what days it rained. <laughs> now, um, we also have a special interest in each of our subjects. And um, I'm just going to show you one subject whose special interest uh, is sports. He happens to be a TV producer. He's produced a lot of program on Discovery Channel and, and other channels of that kind. Uh, but he loves sports, so we'll see what he says. Numbers every game. When was the last time the Redskins beat the Steelers? Hmm. Let's see. They played him in 2004, and the Steelers won. They played him in 2000, the Steelers. We sat there as he scanned back through 19 seasons in 19 94. seconds. Oh, in 91. In, uh, yeah, they played in 91, November 17th, 1991. And when I ask him a, a score of any particular game, he responds by asking me, which quarter? Um, Mary Lou, Lou Henner, a Hollywood actress uh, who starred uh, years ago in the sitcom Taxi. Any of you saw that Taxi? Um, you sure? Okay. Um, she is one of our subjects. She has this uh, ability, and I'll just show you one little clip about her. Oops. We've lost the sound. Vents and Mary Lou's life to try and stump her. October 26th, 1976. Okay, October 26th, 1976. 1976 was a Tuesday. Oh, I went to... Uh, I went to shoot a ring around the collar commercial in Venice, Italy, <laughs> and you saw a second and a half mood shot of Venice, and then a gondolier singing, of love I sing, tra la la la, for you got ring around the collar la. And I went, my powder didn't work. Of <laughs> love I sing, la 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 la. More than 30 years later, around the -la -la. my powder didn't work. Dead on. Um, the week. After that um, appeared on Sunday, December 19th, um, <laughs> over 600 people sent me emails. And most of those were people who said they had the same ability. And the others were, I know somebody who does. And the others were advice on how to do research and you know, <laughs> things of that kind. Uh, so we set up a, a, a group to do testing, and we have tested all of those subjects, and I continue to get two or three a week even today, two days, two years after that. We test them. We can only test them on public autobiographical events, not on their private ones. If they pass the test on the public, then we bring them to Irvine, and we do a lot of experiments, uh, or we do Skype. We do a lot of ways of testing them. So I'll show you something about them. Now, follow me on this. It's a little complex, but not too complex. This is the percent correct on a test that we give on public events uh, that occurred over uh, several decades. And this would be zero correct, and this goes all the way up to 75% correct. In orange are normal controls that are age and sex match to our experimental subjects. And so what you see here is that uh, on the average, they're, they're getting between 10 and 15% correct on these kind of tests about what happened when, all right? Those are the orange ones. Now, the blue are the people who called in to say that they have this ability just like the people they saw on 60 Minutes. And I direct your attention to these people right here. There's more of them, that's why they're higher. But this is a normal distribution of people who think they have the ability but do not. And then I draw your attention to this group over here who think they have the ability, and they definitely don't have any ability. <laughs> Go figure. Anyway, we have this. 
So what we have done was to, to select out of all of the blue here, the people who did the very best over here, they get over half of them correct on this very difficult test of what happened when, what dates and days and so on. And these are HSAM, the HSAMs, highly superior autobiographical memory. And these are the people that we work with. And as you can see, we have a lot of people over here that we could work with who still have the ability, but they're not quite as good. And we have to put our resources on the best of the best. So these are the folks here. And by this time, we have probably 40 people who are in this category over here, and a lot of people who think they are, but who are not in that category. Now here's some examples of it. Here is a, um, a test that we, we give. Um, we pick 10 computer-selected random dates, and the subjects are supposed to tell us the day of the week. They have to give us a verifiable um, event, and we're, we're loose on this. We say within a month of that event, any event that you can think of within a month of that. Then they have to give a, an autobiographical event, and we average all of this, and what you see, the controls are in the orange, and they do very poorly, and these people who are on, on the end of that distribution do very well indeed on this autobiographical test. Uh, here's another one in which we are much tougher on the verifiability. We ask them very specific things. What was the address of your first apartment after leaving college? What was the date of your graduating from high school? Questions of that kind that are very specific and very verifiable because we can get the information from their records, from relatives, and so on. And so you see what we have here is a large number of verifiable events given by our subjects. And in the case of the controls, we didn't even try to verify it. We just asked, can you tell us those dates? And they couldn't even do as good when they could make up anything they wanted to. <laughs> so these people are, these, these people are, are they're what you saw, what, what you saw in the little film clips. Those are not highly selected. They, they well, they're, they're high, we have other people who are highly selected like them. Now, we're, we're trying to find out what's going on, what makes this happen. So one of the first things that we did was to uh, scan their brains um, using MRI, and I report here results which we've just published, in which we have identified nine regions of the brains of our HSAM subjects that differ from those of controls. And I'm showing you some of them here. All of the regions that we've identified uh, are regions that in other experiments using functional brain imaging have been identified as regions that are important, importantly involved in autobiographical remembering. So there is a connection there. Now in showing these to you, I'm not offering an explanation, I'm just showing you something we found here. We don't know whether this is cause or whether it's an effect. We, don't e we can't even say that it is, it is directly related to the behavior, but certainly there is a difference between the controls and our subjects and these. We have to look at this more carefully and we have to do functional imaging a lot, but this is the first step and there's something here that is of interest. Over in the lower left-hand corner is, is also something that is of interest. Um, our HSAM subjects are, to a large degree, and almost uh, in all subjects, are compulsive. They're obsessive and compulsive. Now, I can't say that as a diagnosis because we haven't had them diagnosed I can just give you exemplars of the kinds of things that they do to illustrate it. Um, many of them are germ avoidance. So if the keys fall on the floor, they have to be washed before they are used. Um, uh, one of our favorite subjects will not wear shoes and have shoelaces because shoelaces touch the floor and there are germs on the floor. If his pen falls on the floor, he throws it away. Uh, it's germ avoidance. Another one of ours when we were interviewing um, it takes me a while to drag them out of it, by the way, when I interview them, to admit that they are somewhat compulsive. Um, walks around with a, a stack of napkins because he says, you can't tell when somebody has touched an object before he has, and so he pawns a napkin so he can touch the object with a napkin in his hand. Um, another one of our subjects, I can tell you who it is because most of you saw her on, on TV, uh, Mary Lou Henner. Um, has, uh, I think, every pair of shoes that she's ever owned, and she stores them in her closet with toe-in, toe-out pairs, and she remembers the date of purchase and the date of last worn of every one of, looks to me like, a hundred pair of shoes. She has her closet organized by color, date of last wearing, uh, purchase, and so on. Um, looks pretty, you know, to me, to a, a non-psychiatrist, looks pretty compulsive, but I leave it to your judgment. <laughs> 
Now, these, um, these individuals uh, raise a whole lot of questions that, that we struggle with, including I struggle with whether I should include that in my talk that has to do with selectivity of memory because their memory appears not to be as selective as we think it ought to be because they just remember a lot of stuff. Our first subject, for example, one of her questions I ask her is, did she know who Bing Crosby was? And, uh, and she was uh, 33 at the time, and this was in, uh, uh, well, it was, it was 13 years ago. And I said, did she know who Bing Crosby was? And, and she said, yes. And I said, do you know what happened to him? And she said, yes, he died. Well, any of you know where he died? Where? In Spain. He died on a golf course in Spain. How many of you know the date and the day? <laughs> I can wait. <laughs> well, she just blithely told me the date and the day, and I said, well, how did you know that? She said, well, my mother was uh, driving me to a soccer game that she was playing in, and the news came in on over the radio when she was 13 years old. Um, not much selectivity in that, so that puzzles us. Why is it that they capture what I would regard as trivia, a lot of it, and they capture it? What possible insights do we have about memory? Here's, here's the big question. Um, if you fail to remember something, is it because you didn't store it properly or because the mechanisms involved in retrieving that information are not working well? And we don't know how to solve that problem. That is, it, there simply is no um, uh, psychological work on memory which has been able to allow us to detect a deficit in storage from a deficit in retrieval mechanism. It's a very complicated issue. And so we don't know whether these people are better because they store more than we do. We may, we may store all, everything that we experience in the same way. And we're just impaired in the ability to retrieve. Well, they are certainly not impaired in the, in the ability to retrieve. You saw that. But is it because also that the information is so readily available? We don't know. Is this a novel capacity? Or is this a capacity that we all have and somehow they're just revealing it? <coughs> and we don't know. Now, in uh, ancient times, <coughs> before uh, there was a praying press, and before there were computers, and before there were cell phones, people had to remember things. Like when the printing press came along, you could write it down and you didn't have to remember it because it was written down and you could check it later. And a lot of what we do right now, we don't write down, or we just, it's in the cell phone or it's in the computer, and that's, that's our memory. So one of the questions is, in centuries past, was there much more pressure to remember than there is right now? And maybe we decline in this ability because there hasn't been pressure on us in the centuries since, at least since the printing press. That's probably wrong, but it's something, uh, uh, something to think about. In the ancient times, it is said that when <clears throat> it was important to recall, uh, to, to store a public event, such as a marriage between two tribes or an agreement about a land a swap or something of that kind, they would have a young child witness the ceremony and then they would throw the child into a river afterwards so that the child would have a stronger memory of that. Now, if there were people around who had the memory of these kinds of folks, they would not have to have used the child. Uh, now, is this innate or is it acquired? Uh, some people have made the argument that this is acquired because people just develop the skill of remembering and they work on it. Well, I, I gave this uh, a lecture like this uh, at uh, UCLA last Friday afternoon. And the next day, I was talking with a young professor at UCLA, and he was so excited he could hardly talk. He says, my child is just like that, is a five-year-old child. This five-year-old child, they will be driving along on a road, and his child will say, oh, the last time we drove on, on this uh, road was on September 27th. It was a Tuesday. We were on our way to visit so-and-so. And so they don't test him. He claims they do not test him, but the child just spontaneously gives the date and the day on which events occurred over the last two years and just loves doing it. Um, now this is important because it says that this is an ability, if this is all true, uh, an ability that emerges very early on and it's not something that is based on extensive practice throughout life. Now to back up a little bit, uh, we had already started a project uh, looking at 
memory and such children. There's even, you can see it on YouTube, there is, I think it's called Memory Boy on, on YouTube, a young boy about five years old who looks for all the world like he has this kind of ability. So we are in the process of identifying children like this throughout the United States and we will be investigating them as much as we can in the same way uh, that we've investigated the adults. Um, this will be important because most of them have told us that they recognized that they had this ability when they were about 11 years old. That does not mean that it emerged at that time. It means that that's when they realized that they were different from other people in having this ability. So we want to find that out. Um, we are also uh, doing genetic studies. As a matter of fact, we have colleagues this week uh, from Basel, Switzerland, who are working with a team here um, to do genetic analyses of each of the subjects that we have. And that work is underway to find out whether there is a possible genetic basis, at least in part, uh, to this ability. And as I said, we are doing neurobiological studies. We've already done uh, structural MRI, and we will be doing functional, and we will be doing whatever we can to try to unravel this mystery of very highly superior memory. Now, lots of people have contributed to my research over the years, uh, and uh, it, you know, I would have, to, if I listed them all, it would take several of these uh, figures. But um, for the last part, I want to particularly point out uh, Aurora Laporte, who is the graduate student who has spearheaded all of the work with the highly superior autobiographical uh, memory and is the lead author on our most recent paper on this. Uh, it's, it's a a terrific job that she's doing managing this very complex project of, of, of examining memories in these uh, highly important people. I'm going to end with, with uh, this <clears throat> little statement about the people. Um, they really like the group here. They like us. And the reason that they like us is because we pay attention to them and we tell them that they are very important. Up until this in their lives, they've been the person that say, show off for us, will you show the trick you can do about memory? And they haven't been taken seriously as people who are really contributing important ideas. One of the most, not one of them, the most important finding ever in the, in the history of memory research was a finding by Scoville and Milner that if they took out the medial temporal region of the brain of subjects, that they lost the ability to learn any new cognitive information they had short-term memory, could not make new memories, and they had all of their old memories, and so memory was fractionated into different kinds. And in 1957, that started all of the research on memory in a very different way than it had from what it had been before. It was a seminal paper. There's studies of memory before Scoville and Milner and studies of memory afterwards. It's just as simple as that. We hope that in, in the long run, that this kind of work will have some impact in which we can say, by studying these people who have, have this extraordinary memory ability, and when we can discover something about the basis or the bases of that, that this will provide new information about how our brains work to make lasting memories. Thank you very much.